last week one of the stalwart passages we discussed was Galatians 5, 1. And it says this, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. It's a freedom above all other freedoms. It's a freedom that no one can take away. Talking about freedom this way reminds me of the movie Braveheart. Has anybody seen the movie Braveheart? Let's see a show of hands. Okay, a lot of us have, right? Mel Gibson plays William Wallace. It's one of those movies that brings the inner warrior out of you, right? And then there's that scene at the end that's so moving. It's so awe-inspiring where William Wallace yells what? Freedom, right? From the top of his lungs. And it's so powerful because this man gave everything he had, including his very own life, for freedom. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm here to tell you that we're supposed to be like William Wallace for Christ. We're supposed to have the same intensity for spiritual freedom. We're supposed to have the same veracity for the freedom in Christ because we're called to be warriors for Christ, amen? And I know many of you are fighting for the spiritual freedom we have in Christ every day. I know that Al is battling. I know that Steve is battling. I know that Ralph is battling. I know that many of us, Deborah's battling, Pat's battling. We're all battling for the spiritual freedom we have in Christ. But today, I want to encourage us to keep on fighting because the war rages on. The war rages on. And often, we're battling, looking at things from the outside, looking at the war only from what's happening in the world. But there's another war raging on. And it's between the flesh and the spirit. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about this morning. So let's open our Bibles to Galatians 5, 13 through 17. Galatians 5, 13 through 17. And I've entitled this message, The War Within. So as we begin, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Holy Father, I ask that you illuminate our hearts and minds by the power of your spirit this morning. That you would help us to truly praise, praise the Father Praise the Son. Praise the Holy Spirit. Help us to be zealous for you, God, this morning. Help us to battle for you, to depend on your Spirit, and to walk against the flesh. And bless everybody here this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, Galatians 5.13 starts by saying this. You... My brothers and sisters were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. So let's first understand what the flesh is here, because the flesh isn't talking about the actual flesh on our bones. But the flesh here is referring to our fallen spiritual nature. It's the darkened nature that everyone's born with since the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. Another word for flesh would be the sinful nature. Or if you're a KJV fan, it's it's carnal nature. So Paul says, don't use your freedom for an excuse to indulge in your sinful nature. And it's ironic because last week, Paul was telling the Galatians, you're free in Christ, so don't go back into bondage. It's as if Paul knows the Galatians may go from one extreme to the other. As last week, again, Paul was telling them, don't live a life of what? Do you guys remember? It starts with an L. 
legalism, right? Yes, don't live a life of legalism. Don't focus on your works to save you. No, in Christ you're already saved, which means you're free. But here today, Paul says don't go the opposite extreme and think freedom in Christ means you live however you want. And this leads to point number one. Legalism and indulgence are really two sides of the same coin. Legalism is one side of the coin and indulgence in the flesh is the other side of the coin. I mean, think about it. When I'm legalistically living to earn God's favor through my works to be saved, who am I focused on? Myself, right? And yet, we can go to the other extreme, right? We can live a life of indulgence. I I live to do whatever it takes to find some sort of shallow happiness in my life. Who am I focused on again? Self. And many of us have lived from one extreme to the next. We went from being legalistic, we adamantly followed the rules and regulations for everything because we weren't really sure if God would accept us. To finally breaking free of the legalism when we truly understood God's amazing grace. But the problem was, then we ended up going to the other extreme. We started indulging in the flesh, using our freedom in Christ for a license to sin. The point is, legalism and indulgence in the flesh are so easy for us to vacillate between because they're both cut from the same fabric. They are both have the same DNA because both are workings of our fallen nature, the flesh, the sinful nature. Again, they're both two sides of the same coin. Because legalism and indulgence are both works of the flesh, the sinful nature. Does that make sense so far? Are we following me? Yes, okay, good. As a sinful nature, the flesh leads us to worship self instead of God. That's the motivation. That's the goal of the flesh, the sinful nature. It's always to get our attention off of God and place it on something else. So our flesh is quite satisfied when we go from legalism to indulgence or to indulgence to legalism or vice versa. Just as long as we continue to keep the focus on ourselves, worshiping ourselves, we, which keeps us away from worshiping our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So the next question that follows is, well, how do we actually combat this sinful nature? How do we actually combat living for ourselves instead of God? How do we make sure we don't fall into legalism or the indulgence of the flesh? Right? That's the the natural next question. Well, Paul tells us, Galatians 5.13, He says this, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Serve one another humbly in love. So let's stop here because Paul says, don't use your freedom to feed the flesh, but instead humbly serve one another out of love. So the question I want to ask you guys, who are the Galatians supposed to humbly serve out of love? What group of people is Paul referring to here? The church, right? The church, The answer is the local church. Paul says, use your freedom in Christ to love your fellow brothers and sisters in the local church. And this leads to point number two. The solution to indulging in the flesh is to love your local church family. I mean, that's so ironic. Now, you might have not heard this before, 
But I've heard many who say they're Christians, they say things like this, I don't have to be a part of the church to be a Christian. Or they say something like this, the church is just too worldly for me. Or they say something like this, this is probably one that you may not have heard, but this is what I've heard. They say something like this, the church is just full of a bunch of what? Hypocrites, right? And to that, we would tell them we have room for one more. (laughs) Amen? Amen? Right? Because, of course, I I agree that the church is a real mess. We see even the first century, it was a real mess, right? But it's no surprise Because whenever you put a bunch of sinners together, like us, we're going to have issues, amen? We all have issues, amen? If you don't believe me, just ask your spouse. I mean, honestly, the poor elders and staff have to put up with my issues every day. Amen, Casey, wherever you're at. John, Matt, you guys are silent. Susan, anything? Oh, John, it's not true. You're right, I am so good, right, John? He knows the most. (laughs) Sorry, John. You shouldn't be lying in church. That's really bad. But what we see here is that part of the normal Christian life, part of faithfully serving Christ is learning to love those in the local church. As Paul's counsel to the Galatians is to to serve your local church family out of love instead of indulge in the flesh. And then Paul goes on. Galatians 5, 13 through 16, he says this. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the the desires of the flesh. So Paul says here, love one another instead of fighting with each other. And then he says, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So if we walk by the spirit, we won't gratify the flesh. We just need to walk by the Spirit. Let's say that together. We need to walk by the Spirit. Let's say it one more time. We need to walk by the Spirit. So when we have a problem, we need to walk by the Spirit. When life is going good, we need to walk by the Spirit. When someone hurts us, we need to Walk by the Spirit. When our children aren't obeying us and we're losing our minds, I didn't know they were going to be here today. I'm sorry. They're usually in children. Sorry, guys, right? We need to what? Walk by the Spirit. Just remind, yeah, children remind, parents remind me sometimes, right? So let's just walk by the Spirit, right? Let's go, Spirit. Let's walk, right? We need to walk by the Spirit. But wait a minute here. Wait a minute. How do we actually walk by the Spirit? What does it actually mean to walk by the Spirit? I know you guys are getting tired of this, right? Me saying walk by the Spirit. Well, in our verses, Paul doesn't actually give us an explanation or an answer per se. So let's sort of flesh what it means to walk by the Spirit, explain what that means. Now, walking by the Spirit starts with someone who's a follower of Christ. They've repented and believed on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and now the Holy Spirit indwells them, and this leads to point number three. You have to have the Spirit to walk by the Spirit. You have to have the Spirit to walk by the Spirit. 
So Paul says, talking to the churches in Galatia, he recognizes they are already believers in Christ. But here this morning, with this large group and those watching online, there probably are some that aren't believers yet, right? So, so to walk by the Spirit means you first have to turn to Christ. So I would encourage you this morning, if that's you, then I would plead with you to submit to Christ Jesus. Turn to Christ in repentance and faith, which means you turn from yourself, living for yourself as your own Lord, and worship the true Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is your only hope, amen? As John 14, 6, Jesus says this, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Christ here doesn't say he's a way or some way, but he specifically says he's the what? Only way. He's the only way. And the reason being, just to explain this real quick, the reason being is because Christ takes on our sin, every past, present, and future sin, and in return, he imputes or gives us his righteousness. We call this the glorious exchange, and oh, how glorious, magnificent it is because we're not only saved, loved, adopted, and redeemed, but we also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God himself indwells us. So this now gives us the the ability to now walk by the Spirit when we have the Spirit. But again, what does it actually look like to walk by the Spirit? We haven't answered that yet, right? How do we as believers walk by the Spirit? Well, let's first talk about briefly what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean we follow our hearts. As Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart is what? deceitful and wicked. Also, walking by the Spirit doesn't mean we're led by our feelings. Feelings are often connected to what we want. Can you imagine what that would look like, right? You know, I don't think I'm going to do the dishes tonight as I'm being led by the Spirit to watch the the basketball game that's on, amen, right? Amen, sports fans? Or here's one more for fun. Walking by the Spirit doesn't mean we follow signs. We don't follow the Spirit through laying out a fleece or interpreting dreams or looking for shapes in the sky. Ironically, before the election, we saw this. I don't know if you can recognize what that looks like. I, my, my children saw it first, but we saw an actual Trump cloud <laughs> and thought maybe it's a what? A sign. A sign. Oh, boy. I'm not going to say another word about that. I have some other stuff written here. I'm thinking, I better not say that. So the, the question still remains, right? How do we what? Walk by the Spirit. I have like an hour, so I got to like fill in time with something. I mean, we want to know for sure that we're being led by the Spirit. We need something objective. We need something that's reliable. Can we guess what that is? What do we turn to? The Bible, God's Word, right? We look to God's inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word. Ephesians 6.17 says this, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. What we see here is that the Holy Spirit, it's his weapon of choice is God's word. And we get a picture of when we're studying God's word, when we're meditating on God's word, the Holy Spirit is using it like a weapon to convict us, to challenge us, to open our eyes to the deceptions we believe, to encourage us. For example, maybe I'm trusting too much in my own understanding 
Maybe I'm trusting in myself too much when I'm full of pride in myself, when I start thinking I just need to work harder, I need to sort of depend on myself, pull myself up by my own bootstraps, and I have everything I need within myself. I am a powerful person, amen? No, not amen. No, right? Not amen to that, right? Because we could turn, I read, all of a sudden I'm reading the word and I turn to Proverbs 28, 26 that says this, those who trust in themselves are fools. Fools. And the Spirit uses this verse like a sword to instantly convict my prideful, high-minded heart, and I realize how I'm putting my faith in myself instead of Christ. And this leads to point number four. Walking by the Spirit is knowing and going with God's word. Walking by the Spirit is knowing and going with God's word. It's first knowing the word. I ask you, how do we grow it to know the word? And the answer is by spending lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of time in God's word. It looks like studying God's word, memorizing God's word, meditating on God's word. It's praying God's word. It's listening to preaching of God's word. It's taking notes in God's word. So that we can, secondly, go with God's word. It's putting the knowing into action. It's living out God's word in real life. It's bringing the word to life. What we see here is that when we're walking out God's word, we're actually walking by the spirit. Do we see that? So the next question then is why is it so hard to walk by the Spirit? Why do we often have such a hard time living out God's Word? Well, let's go back to our verses to find out. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. It says this, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. So Paul tells us here, he tells the Galatians the reason why they struggle to follow the Spirit is because they have low self-esteem. Is that what he says? That's not Paul. That's the psychologist, right? And a lot of bad Christian books. Or Paul says to the Galatians, their past or the wounds of the past are hindering them from following the Spirit in the present. Is that what he says? No, again, that's a psychologist. Not God's word. Oh, this, I got it now. Paul says it's Satan's fault, right? Satan is the reason why the Galatians struggle to follow the Spirit, right? Is that what he says? Paul actually tells the Galatians it's their fault. Listen again. Galatians 5, 17. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. We get a picture here of, the, of this inner spiritual battle going on in our hearts between the sinful nature and the Holy Spirit. And Paul says the reason why we have a hard time walking by the spirit is because my own fallen nature that lives within me. And this leads to point number five. The enemy lives within. The enemy lives within. It's it's really a wonder to me why it's so uncommon for churches to talk about our main problem, which is our sinful nature. Throughout church history, we see they understood the battle between the flesh and the spirit, but many today have no clue about this battle that rages within their own hearts. (laughs) 
But James in 2, 13 through 15 shows us how our flesh leads us astray. And he gives some great detail. Listen to this. He says this. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it's full grown gives birth to death. We see here the supernatural inner workings of how the enemy within works in our hearts. So let's just sort of break down how James says the sinful nature, the enemy within tempts us to rebel against God. We see that progression number one says this, the flesh tempts us with a sin that we want. The flesh tempts us with the sin that we want. So I think we're getting hungry, so I'm going to use a a food analogy here. If you know me, you know I like sweets. But if you wave a Christmas fruitcake under my nose, I'm not going to be tempted because I don't like them. Some people agree with me, right? But if you wave an ice cream cake in front of me, I'm tempted, I want it. And it's similar with sin. Our flesh knows what tempts us. It places something in front of us that will tempt us to rebel against God. But then... This leads to the next step, progression number two. The temptation goes from a want to a need. It goes from a want to a need. So let's keep this ice cream cake analogy going. And let's say I I see this ice cream cake in the morning in the refrigerator before I go to work. And then I go to work and all day I'm having a hard time concentrating, right? Because guess what I'm thinking about? That ungodly ice cream cake, right? I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking I need that ice cream cake. And I literally daydream about the ice cream cake. And that's like sin. It starts out as a temptation. It's something we would like to have, but we realize rebellion against God probably shouldn't do it. And we hesitate and we say, no, I'm not going to do it, right? But the more we feed on it, the more we're tempted to act on it. As we think about it more and more, our minds become consumed by it to the point we go from wanting it to thinking we can't live without it. We need it to be happy and we begin to do whatever it takes to get our sin of choice. This is what it says in James 2.14. It shows us by saying, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. James here gives us a vivid picture of the dangers as the person is enticed by sin, like a fish is enticed by the bait. The problem is under the bait is what? There's a hook. And when the fish finally takes the bait, he's hooked, right? He's caught. And that's similar to sin in our lives. When we take the sinful bait, we're hooked, we're caught. And this leads to the third step, progression number three. We're enslaved to that sin. We're enslaved to that sin. We're in bondage to the sinful nature as the pleasures last only for a moment. And we're willing to take that momentary pleasure and damage our relationship with God and others. Because we're hooked and we're powerless, we feel to stop living that way. This is what we see in James 2.15, the next verse. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. See, the very sin we thought was going to give us life actually leads to death. The the sin that was going to make us happier and fulfilled leads us to pain and suffering. And the culmination of being a zombie to our sinful nature is described in this quote. It says this, 
Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Oh, how the price of sin is so high. We see people destroy their families. They destroy others. They destroy themselves as they push God away for their sin of choice. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a struggle with sexual sin. Maybe it's hurt that becomes anger and grows into unforgiveness and bitterness that's raging in our hearts. So you might be sitting here convicted. You might be sitting here thinking, Terry, you're talking to me. I'm living for the flesh instead of the spirit. I'm entrapped in bondage to this enemy within the sinful nature. So the question is, how can I change? How can I find freedom from the bondage of sin? From this war within? Well, if this is you and you've been consumed and controlled by your sinful nature, then let me give you just a few tips this morning. Tip number one. Remember God's love for you. Tip number one is remember God's love for you. Remember, if you're in Christ, then you know that God loved you at your very worst. Listen to these sweet words from Romans 5.8. It says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Amen. That's the love God has for you. That's the love God has for all of us that are in Christ Jesus. He died for us at our very worst when we were rebelling against him. So you can have hope this morning if you've blown it over and over again, if you failed more than you can count. Know for certain if you're in Christ, then you can't lose God's love. As he's waiting, he's working, he's letting you hear sermons just like this one so that you'll find hope and courage to run back to your heavenly father. So the first tip again is remember God's love for you. The second word of counsel for those entrapped by sin is tip number two, love God instead of love self. Tip number two is love God instead of love self. Now, I'm going to instantly, some people are going to be shocked by me saying that, right? Because most will say they don't what? Love themselves, right? They say, I don't love myself. I actually hate myself. They say things like this. I hate who I am. I look in the mirror and I have utter disdain for what I become, right? But I'm not asking about how you feel about yourself because biblical love isn't based on feelings, but it's based on what we are focusing on. That's why Jesus in Mark 12, 30 and 31 says in so many words to love God and others like you already love yourself. So Jesus says that naturally we all love ourselves, but again, it's not, oh, I feel so good about myself. It's not like I look in the mirror and say, man, I'm a winner. That's not what it's saying. But it's how we focus on the details of our own lives. For example, some of you right now may be daydreaming about where you want to go for lunch and what you want for lunch, right? Should Should I get a salad or a hamburger? I would vote for the hamburger, right? But my point is, who is the focus on when we're doing that? It's on who? Who are we thinking about at that moment? Self. Jesus is saying how we focus on our own life, how we're so consumed with the details of our own life, have that same intense focus for God and others. And when we're entrapped in sin, it only intensifies our focus on self, which means it intensifies our love for self instead of our love for God. I mean, think about it. Let's go through some questions and you answer these for me. When we hold grudges towards others and bitterness reigns in our hearts, who are we focused on? 
ourselves, right? When we live for shallow happiness to please ourselves, who are we focused on? And you guys aren't sure about this, are you? <laughs> ourselves, right? I'm, I'm going to give you a hint. The answer is the same every time, right? <laughs> when we're living for sexual sin and we look at things we shouldn't be looking at, who are we focused on? ourselves, when we worry about what people and others think about us and we're controlled by people pleasing, who are we thinking about? Ourselves, right? When we give ourselves over to addictions, who are we focused on? Ourselves. What we see is that sin turns us inward to self instead of outward to God. Are you guys following me? I'm not sure if you get this, what I'm saying. You guys got that? Does that make sense? Okay, good. So what do we need to do? What's the answer to being entrapped by sin? How do we actually love God instead of love self? And this leads to tip number three. We put off living for sin and we put on living for Christ. Let me say that again. We put off living for sin and we put on living for Christ. This is what the Bible calls old-fashioned repentance. Repentance is changing the way we think and act. That's what repentance is. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, which we've used often, says this, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So we see here that we put off the sin of choice, we stop living for it, we stop daydreaming about it, we stop thinking about it, and then we stop acting on it, and instead we put on living for God. We start thinking about how we can please God and follow his word instead. And finally, let me just give us one more tip if we're entrapped in sin. It goes back to our verses this morning. Galatians 5.13 you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Paul says in so many words here, put off indulging the flesh and put on loving one another. And this is sort of a repeat of an earlier point, right? Which leads to tip number four, love your local church. Love your local church. We, we've heard the old saying that says, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, I would say it takes the local church to mature in Christ, amen? As Christians, we're called to live in community. And that community is found in the local church. So we overcome sin by encouraging, challenging, rebuking, teaching, loving, and counseling one another with God's word. Oh, friends, if you don't have a local church home, I would encourage you to find one. It doesn't have to be this one either. But I would say find one that's biblically based, that's passionate about God's word as they preach God's word, they sing God's word, they pray God's word for the reality to live out God's word. That's why our mission statement here at Family Church, church says this, Family church exists to glorify God by joyfully living out his word. And let me say, what a joy it is to joyfully live out God's word with one another in the local church. Well, in conclusion, I hope this morning you've seen the battle between the flesh and the spirit and I pray that we fight by walking, depending, relying by the power of the Holy Spirit. I think John Owen said it best when he said this, be killing sin or sin be killing you. So let's today walk out of the church and kill sin and live passionately for Christ. Let's go to him in prayer. Holy Father, we praise you this morning.
We thank you for your word that shows us what our true problem is, Father. We recognize that we have this inward flesh that continues to try to drive us away from Christ. We ask, Father, that you help us to continue to depend and walk by the Spirit, which means we're walking out your word every day, which clearly and consistently shows us what it means to walk by the Spirit. Father, we recognize you can use whatever you want to help us walk in Christ, but we know for sure that you're going to use your word, so help us to depend on it this morning. I thank you that your word is sufficient for all of our lives and that your Holy Spirit uses it to change us from the inside out. May we recognize the spiritual battle that's going on not only in our hearts, but in everyone else's hearts as well and help us to love one another for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.